So I'm going to give an update on uh, weed management for field crops. I'm going to talk about uh, some of the work that uh, we've done over the last couple of years. I'm going to focus a lot on Palmer amaranth um, and some of the other herbicide resistant weeds uh, that are in the area. All right. Um, and uh, talk a little bit about some cover crops, some of the cover crop um, work that we've done, and I might end up talking a little bit about uh, some dicamba soybeans and some of our experiences with the dicamba. Um, you know, we, we're in a situation now where we have to start thinking about our weed control a little bit differently than we did, certainly much differently than we did 18 years ago in 2000. Um, when you know the biggest decision was do we use Syngenta's brand or Monsanto's brand of glyphosate? Um, but how did we kind of get in this situation? Well, it, it's, 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 it's an, been an evolving process. Back in the 70s was really one of the, the first times of or, or resistant weeds with the triazine resistance. It was actually reported first um, in this region, Jim Parachetti, um, the old weed extension specialist at the University of Maryland was one of the first to report it in 1972 with triazine resistance. And, uh, and um, as, as it became wider spread and became more problematic for more people, fortunately in the 80s a whole new group of herbicides came out called the ALS inhibiting herbicides. Those were the ones that we were using at very low rates, things like Accent, Pursuit, uh, uh, Classic. Those ran well for about 10 years and then we started to uh, develop resistance there and um, pretty widespread resistance. Um, and it was right about the time when the glyphosate uh, resistant crops came out, Roundup Ready corn, Roundup Ready soybeans. So folks switched from uh, the, the ALS products to, to, to glyphosate. And that lasted for about 10 years and uh, we're, we started to see resistance to, uh, to, to glyphosate. And so, um, and, and now because we're, we're, we're also seeing more resistance to some of these other products that we've had to rely on, like the PPO herbicides, the group 14s, or the HPPD herbicides, uh, the group 27s. So things like Valor, Authority, Sharp, and Reflex, all PPOs, Callisto, HPPD, while we don't have much resistance in this area to that chemistry, there is problems uh, further south uh, with, with that chemistry. So, so we've got a look, you know, we've, we've got a, a, a history of about 10 years of new technology come on the market and then starting to see resistance. The problem is, the most recent product on this list is Callisto, and it was developed in the 80s. So since 80s, we have not had a new mechanism of action, a new way that herbicides kill weeds. A lot of these are just uh, what we're seeing in the marketplace now, uh, what we call new, are maybe different um, trade names or different active ingredients, but we haven't seen any new mechanism of action. And that's really kind of what we're, we're, we're in need uh, from a chemical standpoint to help us with resistance. And I've been saying for you know, probably the last five years, there's nothing in the pipeline. There's nothing coming new. Well, in January of just this year, FMC announced they have a new mode of action or mechanism of action in corn and soybeans. It's going to be extremely effective on Palmer Amaranth, and this is coming from their chief technology officer. And they're very excited about that. They expect to launch it in 2026. All right, and, and, and that's, that's probably under the rosiest of scenarios, okay? Uh, assuming it even comes to market, I mean, they don't even have a name yet, so assuming it's coming to market. So the point is, we're not, wow, wow it's, it's, it's great that we've got something new coming. Um, it's going to be a while before it gets here, and we're going to have to learn to live with what we currently have. And resistance, um, unfortunately, we're, we're, uh, um, we've got more species that are, uh, that, that are evolving resistance to. Uh, resistance is moving from other parts of the country. And we, we need to be aware of what products we're using and how we can manage for, uh, for, for resistance. And one of the uh, ways is, is understanding what the mechanism of action is that we're using. So we rotate a herbicide mechanism of action as much as possible. 
And so we've developed this chart, we being the uh, Mid-Atlantic group here, uh, Delaware, Maryland, uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, um, also Virginia, and, um, all have kind of taken, taken a chart that was developed for the Midwest that had a lot of Midwest chemistry that doesn't really fit our scenario, and um, developed it, uh, modified that chart for our areas. And we also include a lot of the vegetables and, and sorghum herbicides as well. It's broken out by the mode of action. How is it that these herbicides kill the plants or what do we see on the outside of the plant as they start to die? Um, we further break it down then by the specific sites of action or mechanism of action. And this number here corresponds to the mechanism of action. This is the number that we see on our pesticide, our herbicide containers for what is the, 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 the mechanism of action. With the idea if you're using products with a one on repeatedly, you need to ask yourself, am I setting myself up for resistance? Could I be getting in trouble with this? So we have it broken out by, by uh, the, the group numbers. Um, we have the active ingredient. And then we also have some examples of what that trade name is. And this is what most, most of you are going to recognize. You know, most of you aren't going to recognize clethodin, but you will recognize select. This number here is an indication of the number of weed species in the U.S. that have evolved resistance to this group of, of, of herbicides. So ACCA, so we've got 15. This ALS herbicides, there's 45 different case uh, resistance in the U.S. Um, on the other side of the chart, we have all the, the premixes that are available in the area, things like uh, Anthem ATZ. So what is an Anthem ATZ? It's got, well, it's basically Zidua, Cadet, and Atrazine, group 5, 14, and 15. That uh, um, is to help separate out what, what, what's going on as far as our mechanisms of action and rotating herbicides as much as possible. Jenny's got some copies of this in the back. They're free complimentary of the soybean boards. Um, they've been very supportive of this pro project. Uh, and like I said, we just updated it for this coming season. Another resource um, that if you don't have, you need to get. This is the Mid-Atlantic Field Crop Weed Management Guide. Um, many of you might remember the old publication EB237 that Ron Ritter had put together for years. Um, it, a, a lot of the same information is in here, it's just packaged a little bit differently. We have uh, uh, herbicides labeled for uh, corn, sorghum, soybeans, small grains, hay and pastures. Um, within each of those crops we have what is in those premixes, not only what's in them but what's the ratio of them. So if you're using bicep, how much atrazine are you getting? How much dual are you getting? Um, are you getting enough? You could, uh, that's where these premix tables um, come in. We have relative effectiveness of a number of different weed species, um, uh, and our experience is based on rates and timing. So this is, this is available through the Penn State Extension Publication um, um, Office, uh, where it's being sold at $25 for a hard copy, uh, $15 for a digital or a PDF, and if you buy both, it's $35. And this is updated every year. Third source of, of, of information is a, a project that uh, many of us and uh, my colleagues in the Mid-Atlantic are working on is this uh, website on GROW. So as, we, as I started off saying, you know, we're, we're not going to be able to spray our way out of these problems with herbicide resistant weeds. Um, this is a multi-state uh, uh, project looking at multiple tactics for weed management addressing herbicide resistance. It started out of this uh, uh, project, USDA funded, where we have about 14 different universities across the U.S. involved. Um, and, and all with different experiences but uh, with herbicide resistance weeds, but all really focusing on our region for resistance and how managing weeds early on like in the case of Palmer Amaranth, where it may go from a small patch to a large patch to basically taking the whole field in about three years' time. And we don't focus just on Palmer Amaranth, but uh, mare's tail, ragweed, Italian ryegrass work on, on a variety of different species. And while resistance, you know, mo rotating modes of action are important, that's not the only thing uh, that we need to address from a resistance management standpoint. Need to start looking at rotations. 
okay? Um, so that we make, um, you know, one, rotating gives us an opportunity maybe to use different chemicals, but it also gives us the opportunity to manage weeds maybe at a more critical point in their life cycle. We're also part of this project looking at uh, uh, harvest time weed seed management. That is, what can we do, let's say, the weeds got away from us that year. What can we do at harvest time to minimize our problems going forward? One part of that is, is a Harrington Seed Destroyer. How many of you heard, heard about the Harrington Seed Destroyer? Yeah, it's, uh, it's something they developed in Australia um, and uh, that, that basically pulverizes weed seeds and blows them out of the back of, of, of this machine. There's only about four of them in the United States. Three of them are associated with this project. So it's not something that, you know, it's going to be uh, um, in your dealership next week or next year, but it's that type of idea that we're, we're, we're working with. And then also looking at cover crops. And because cover crops are so widely used in this area, we really have kind of focused on cover crops for weed management um, here in the Mid-Atlantic region. So we have this website. Um, that we're starting to, to, to populate with, with uh, uh, research-based recommendations and, and experiences. Um, it's the integratedweedmanagement.org or grow. You can't just type in grow weeds because you're not going to find this at the top of the list. <laughs> but, it's, but it's no weeds, no, or excuse me, no seeds, no weeds. And uh, in addition to the uh, website, um, we've got a Facebook account and, and um, a Twitter account for, for keeping up with some of the, the projects we have going on. So I want to talk about uh, um, um, expanding the benefits of, of cover crops and, and how that might be helping us with resistance management and overall weed control. Where we generally see the benefits for, for cover crop is when we're letting it get uh, taller and more biomass production, which generally means delaying termination in the, in the spring. Um, we've had a number of projects, uh, both on um, small plot research and on farm, looking at uh, uh, terminating cover crops later and later. Um, we're even uh, doing some projects with this concept of planting green, so killing your cover crop after it's, uh, the, the cash crop's been planted. But part of that, the, 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 um, the benefit or, or the attributes that we're looking for that cover crop is not just total biomass, but also kind of the quality of that, that, that cover crop. We're looking to, to produce it, uh, letting get um, older, closer to, to heading, because it, it, uh, at that point we have more uh, uh, mature tissue, we have tissue that that's resistant to breaking down, stays on the soil surface much longer, and provides a, a longer uh, benefit for, for weed control. Leaves um, from these cover crops we know breaks down very quickly um, and so we're, we're waiting, uh, delaying it allows more mature stems to, uh, um, to develop more lignin tissue. We also know that these are a lot of the same properties of the cover crop that, that's uh, um, helping us with weed control can also impact crop emergence. So we've got to make sure that we make that balance there that, that we can still get a good stand of, of our cash crop without, um, but without sacrificing too much weed control. So part of that then is our thought thinking is how much cover crop do we really need to help us with, with uh, weed management? And this is uh, um, going to kind of show a, a series of different uh, projects here. But this one was done here in, um, uh, in Maryland back in 93. John Teasdale, was, USDA, did this project. And what they did was they looked at various levels of rye mulch and um, over a course of the season counted the number of seedlings that became established in that mulch. And what they found that across a variety of different weed species, about four to 6,000 pounds is what kind of the minimum um, needed to really start to knock down weed density. Fewer weeds uh, establishing in the field. And it was kind of surprising as to how consistent that uh, was uh, across this range of species. And that uh, things like lamb's quarter, you know, that four to 6,000 pounds is reducing um, the density by 80%. Um, the pigweed. Now, this was uh, prior to uh, Palmer Amaranth, 
but uh, uh, Palmer amaranth emergence is, is uh, you know, coming through rye is going to be somewhat similar, but uh, you know, reducing it by two thirds. So that rye is having a tremendous number in the num uh, in how many weeds become established. But how about Palmer amaranth? And so this is um, out of Georgia, where they again looked at a, a range of rye residue on the emergence of Palmer amaranth, and lo and behold, this four to six thousand pounds is where they're back in that about 50% reduction in the density of Palmer amaranth. So, Palmer, so, so the rye is helping us with reducing the number of, of weeds um, that, that become established. It's also helping us in terms of overall control of the weeds as well. Uh, this is um, um, looking at, uh, again, range of, of rye biomass. This is overall weed control. Um, six weeks after planting, so it's not only the rye, um, um, yeah, uh, so, so not only establishment, but also growth of, of the early season weeds of Palmer amaranth. And again, that four to 6,000 pounds is where we're starting to have tremendous impact on the overall control and improving our overall control. And what's happening is, with these, rye, with these cover crops is they're also not only reducing the density, but reducing the rate of growth of weeds. And this is looking at Palmer amaranth, and this is looking at the number of days it took for that Palmer amaranth to reach four inches tall. So where there was no cover, um, it took about 15 days to reach four inches tall. With, with hairy vetch and crimson clover, um, about 20 days. But cereal rye and winter wheat, we're up to about 28 to 30 days um, to reach that four inch height. So while the, the legume cover crops help, they tend to have more fleshy stems, a lot more leaves that tends to break down quicker. And uh, while it helps out, it's not quite as good as the, uh, um, the cereal uh, cover crops that have more stems, more lignin in their tissue. So, so we know that cover crops re can help reduce density, they can reduce the uh, early season growth, gives us a wider window of getting our herbicide, post-merchant herbicides applied and making them overall effective. And a lot of that comes back to um, delaying that termination till the, till the, the, the cover crop reach that early reproductive stage. So uh, while Planting it um, is, uh, in a timely fashion is really important um, to, to get that fall growth, and particularly if you're looking at using that cover crop for nutrient management. But the flip side of that is we get a lot of um, late season biomass production on these cover crops. You know, delaying termination by just a matter of two days can make a tremendous difference in the amount of, of, of biomass that's produced. So we can um, delay that termination in the fall uh, to, to get that additional biomass. And it also allows for more of that lignin tissue to get produced. And that, uh, um, and one thing to be aware of too, with, with the, uh, burning down the cover crops early, um, it gives longer time for that tissue to decay as it's on the soil surface. So delaying that termination as close to planting as possible really helps to maximize the benefit those cover crops are bringing for, for weed control. We need a lot more work though in this area. Um, you know, a lot of the work that uh, we've done is, is based on termination time, uh, seeding rates, I should say. Seeding rates of cover crop. A lot of that has been based on termination, March, mid-April type time. You know, if we're delaying our termination till early May, we get a, a, a tremendous amount of biomass production late in the season. How does that factor into what our seeding rate ought to be? Those are some of the things that we're looking at. Um, obviously, in integrating this with, with, with herbicide use and the uh, implications of having additional biomass out there for, for weed control, and um, examining some of the issues that uh, um, may come up with, with planting that cash crop with having more biomass out there. Um, this is uh, not only myself, but a number of, of the researchers in Maryland, Delaware, Virginia, Pennsylvania are looking at this and, and kind of addressing some of those issues with cover crops. 
Any questions, comments about cover crops before I switch gears here? Yeah, how about shatter cane? Or, uh, how does that work with shatter cane? The cover crops with, with shatter cane? I haven't worked specifically with that. Um, I've worked with some other large seeded species like morning glory. Um, and, uh, morning and it does a pretty, it, again, by itself, it doesn't eliminate the, 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 the morning glory. But it, we're, we're seeing fewer, um, fewer morning glory plants and it's growing slower with that cover crop. So I would imagine that that shatter cane um, we're going to have similar results. Um, in one of your pictures, it showed the uh, pounds of biomass for the cover crop. And uh, between November and March, it looked like the number didn't change at all as far as biomass. Is that common to see virtually no change? Yes. So the question was, one of the charts showed biomass in November versus biomass in March. And it looked like it was comparable number and uh, and yes I mean that that's that you know we're heading into that winter period and uh, we, we're we're not getting a, a lot of additional biomass during that time frame you get into March you know March and into mid-April and and it's a much steeper curve on as far as production all right small grains just going to talk about some of the uh, um, things that we've been seeing with small grains um, the last couple years. We're finding more problems with Italian ryegrass and common chickweed, and primarily because of resistance. We've got uh, Italian ryegrass that's resistant to the ACCase or Group 1 herbicides and ALS inhibiting herbicides, the two products we've been using for years targeting Italian ryegrass control. Um, um, common chickweed, common chickweed, um, we're seeing more problems with common chickweed uh, that's resistant to Harmony Extra. Um, we have populations uh, in this region that uh, are, are, are very resistant to that, that, that class of chemistry. Um, not only resistant to Harmony Extra, but also, also resistant to Finesse and Peak. And uh, we don't have a lot of good alternatives uh, to, to replace Harmony Extra for common chickweed. Mainly because the other products either aren't quite as effective or they limit our rotations, particularly with, with vegetables. Some of the options um, for alternatives, Quellex, um, or Star Rain, or Metribuzin. Um, the, uh, um, the spring applications um, of, of these products, uh, we have to be careful if we're rotating to vegetables. Uh, the uh, um, the Metribuzin um, is, has a fairly narrow window of crop safety, and that's at green up, so in the next couple of weeks. Um, it's very effective on common chickweed, but if you kind of miss that optimum window for op, um, application, you can cause significant leaf burn, and we have seen it impact yield uh, if we delay those applications uh, into late March. Italian, or Italian ryegrass or annual ryegrass, um, it's been, we've had problems with resistance for a long time. Uh, Holon, if any of you remember the, the product Holon, we had some resistance to that back in the, uh, the 90s. Products like Osprey and Powerflex came out, were very effective on Italian ryegrass, but now we're, we're seeing resistance to them as well. Um, so if you have populations that are still, that are not resistant, you know, Osprey or Powerflex in the fall works extremely well. Um, Axial um, applied in the fall or in the, in the spring um, will, will uh, be very helpful. Um, but remember, we've seen resistance popping up to this chemistry. We can't over rely on it um, on an annual basis for Italian ryegrass control. Those populations that are resistant to uh, um, uh, the group two herbicides, um, that means the Osprey and the Powerflex won't control them. Axial still works on some of these populations. 
but we have had problems with group one. We've, um, uh, I know over on the uh, southern Maryland, uh, they have populations that are resistant to axial as well as the group two herbicides. Our options at that point, if you have Italian ryegrass, is the use of Zidua at planting. Too late for this year, um, but uh, that, that uh, for Italian ryegrass, the Zidua at planting has, has worked um, quite well. Um, some of the other products, uh, Axiom uh, does okay. Um, Prowl not as effective as the other two. So resistance is not just something we're, we're, we're dealing with in corn, soybeans. It's also uh, a problem we're seeing in small grains. Certainly anyone's growing vegetables uh, has been dealing with resistance for a long time. Okay, moving on to Palmer Amaranth. Um, Palmer Amaranth is, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's been in this region um, for quite a while. Uh, we did a survey of the herbariums in, in, in this region, and it was reported in the 80s. Um, samples from Worcester County and from Baltimore County. Um, in Delaware, I think it was uh, late 80s was the first sample uh, sent to the herbarium. Um, out of DC, the uh, 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 Smithsonian Herbarium had um, in the late 50s was the first sample. So it's been in this area for a long time, but it's just in the last 10 years where it has really exploded. And, and uh, a lot of that has to do with the, uh, re the resistance that we're seeing. Palmer amaranth, you know, we, we, we're dealing with it, uh, we're, we're learning to deal with it. And I think that uh, while it's not anything we can take lightly, at the same time, it is something that we still have some good tools for, for, for managing it. Um, but one of the things that's helping us is crop rotation. And we find that Palmer amaranth controlling corn tends to be more effective than Palmer amaranth controlling soybeans. Part of it is the chemistry that we have available to us in corn. But the other part is, you know, during that early part of the season when we plant our corn and we're doing our post-emergent sprays, we don't have as high of temperatures as we do when we start to get into our soybean uh, uh, time period. So this is just looking at growing degree days, one way of indicating how much heat units are out there for plant growth. And just note that the, the taller the bars, the faster plants are growing. So in this time period when we're often spraying our post-emergence herbicides for soybeans, we're not having as many heat units or as high of temperature as when we start to get into our soybean uh, post-emergence spraying. So timing of, of application in soybeans is much more critical than it is in corn. We know that uh, Palmer amaranth's prone to resistance, um, that uh, in our area we've got glyphosate and ALS resistant uh, um, Palmer amaranth. Um, in other parts of the U.S., there's reports of uh, 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 resistance to the dinitrile analids. That's, those are the uh, yellow herbicides, like Prowl and Treflan, uh, down in the Carolinas and, and um, out in the Midwest. PPO resistant, group 14, we're talking Valor, uh, uh, Authority, Sharpen, Reflex, Cobra, Ultra Blazer, uh, where they're, they're having problems with resistance. And then um, in, in Illinois, there's some HPPD resistant uh, Palmer amaranth. And this is uh, um, resistant to Callisto, Laudis, Impact, um, Armazon. They have some populations out there that are resistant um, also to uh, uh, five different groups of herbicides. So it is, a, it is one of those species that where we, we can develop some, some uh, resistance quite quickly. Um, some of the key points for managing it, starting off clean, Palmer amaranth grows fast. We don't have as many options post-emergence um, as we used to. So we've got to start clean, meaning Palmer amaranth needs to be dead when we're planting our crop. Using the right product, and particularly in soybeans, that means um, using two effective ingredients. We find that uh, using single active ingredients, while it helps a lot for Palmer amaranth, we get much better control when we're using two different uh, um, effective ingredients. I'll talk about that in just a minute. Using the right rate, um, and made, so that we're using the full labeled rate, and applying at the right timing. 
So for corn, some of the products that we have available that, that, that work well um, for corn and, and uh, um, um, for Palmer Amaranth control in corn, uh, the pre-emergence um, of, of, of a triazine plus one of these uh, long chain fatty acids or group 15, products like Harness Extra, Bicep, uh, Zidual plus Atrazine. And while I don't have it on this slide, another op Prowl plus atrazine for a real low cost um, really helps with, with Palmer Amaranth control um, early in the season. But and because Palmer Amaranth continues to germinate over a very long period of time, we almost always have to come in with a post product. And so some of the best options we have uh, are, are uh, Callisto, um, and, and that could be you know Callisto by itself um, in at, um, excuse me with glyphosate or the Halix product. Laudis uh, or Impact or Amaranthine. All of these are very effective when they're tank mixed with a little bit of atrazine for co um, controlling Palmer Amaranth. Dicamba, some of the di uh, safe and dicamba products like Status and, and um, Diflex um, have shown good results on Palmer Amaranth. As I mentioned with the Callisto and those HPPD inhibiting herbicides, just adding a little bit of atrazine really helps out. So this is Callisto alone on Palmer Amaranth in the greenhouse. While it's, it's slowing it up and causing a lot of whitening, um, adding just a quarter pound of atrazine just really makes it look much, much better. So these, these uh, um, HPPD herbicides really need to be applied with atrazine. Since they need to be applied with atrazine, they've got to be applied before that corn is 12 inches tall. Soybeans, pre-emergence herbicides, two effective mechanisms of action, two group numbers. So tank mixing a, a, a group 14 like a Valor or Authority product with either Metribuzin or one of the long chain fatty acids like Dual, Zidua, or, or Anthem. Again, tank mixes of these products work much more effective than either one of them alone. And making sure that both those products are equally effective on Palmer Amaranth. Uh, so here's an example of what I mean by that. Here's a product called Valor XLT. It's a group 14 and a group 2 herbicide. So we have two different mechanisms of action. That's good, right? More modes of action, the better, right? Um, so that's uh, really a combination of Valor plus Chlorimiron. So we sprayed Valor XLT in the greenhouse. Excellent control. But what we did then was kind of separate this out. What does Valor by itself? Um, this is the equal amounts of Valor in these two uh, trays. Again, excellent control. But when we look at just the Chlorimiron part, that's the classic part, we got no control. So looking at using multiple effective modes of action, that's what we're getting at. That doesn't mean that if you have, um, you know, in your field not to use chlorimiron, because while it's not helping with Palmer amaranth, it may be helping with some of the other species, particularly something like uh, uh, morning glory. So making sure you match the active ingredients that you're using with what your expected weed population will be. Oh, so here's, here's the uh, uh, repeat of that corn slide. Um, ask, uh, well, you know, what about using Lexar or, or one of these type products pre-emergence? And I guess my, my response to that is if you know you're going to come back post-emergence and you're going to use, need something other than just glyphosate, these products really um, are not going to help you out too much. While they may expand that uh, length of residual control, if you've got Palmer Amaranth, using these products, you're still going to have to come back post-emergence. So maybe saving, saving your money from some of these Cadillac pre-programs and putting that towards your post-program. I will say though, if you're in a situation where you've got your field spread out all over and you may not be able to get back to some of these fields in a timely fashion and you know Palmer Amaranth is a concern, so you know, may, may, maybe, maybe you have to go to that little bit higher uh, price program to give you a little bit longer residual control. But if you're able to get into your fields in a timely fashion, um, these products, um, you know, I, I don't really see that, that these are necessary for Palmer Amaranth control. We're using the same type of HPPD herbicide post-emergence, picking up that Palmer Amaranth. Post-emergence for soybeans, um, um, 
you know, we, uh, we, we like to see a post-emergence herbicide that controls the emerge weeds, but also something that's going to give us some residual control. Because we know Palmer amaranth con continues to germinate throughout the summer. So something that's going to help later germinating uh, Palmer amaranth. Um, so uh, um, one of the things we like uh, that has worked well with us is, is Reflex um, as a post-emergence herbicide. It controls Palmer amaranth, but it also provides some residual control. Tank mixing uh, uh, reflex with glyphosate really broadens that program. Uh, Flexstar GT is a, uh, just a, a, a prepackaged mix of, that, of those same two products. Liberty Link soybeans, we've had good luck with Liberty on uh, Palmer Amaranth control, but we know Pal Liberty doesn't provide any residual control. So that's an, a situation where um, you'll want to add a residual herbicide with that Liberty like Reflex, Dual, or Warrant to provide some residual control. And with the new uh, technology that, that's out there with the uh, dicamba resistant soybeans and now the 2,4-D resistant soybeans, um, also an, an option provided your field situation. Um, but these products do not provide residual control, um, so they need to have a residual herbicide like the Reflex, Dual, or Warrant tank mixed with them. If you're in fields with continuous soybeans we've, uh, and Palmer amaranth is an issue for you, we've got to be careful that we don't overuse these PPO herbicides. Uh, and so these are the ones that uh, we really need to be careful that we're rotating um, and, and uh, not using repeatedly year after year. Uh, Again, just kind of looking at some of the, uh, um, uh, the right products for post-emergence. We talked about Callisto, Laudis, Impact, the Safe and Dicambas, and uh, Liberty with Liberty Link Corn. So right products, using it at the right rate. Um, you know, if, if you're using a post-emergence corn um, and, and looking at Callisto, then you're getting the equivalent of three fluid ounces of Callisto. If you're using Reflex, that you're using the full rate of reflex of a, of a, a pint and a half. Um, a lot of these premixes are, are um, put together in the jug and they may not be developed for our region or specifically for Palmer Amaranth. They may, they may not have uh, enough of these products at the right, at the right rate. And so the best way to, to keep up with that information, again, is our Mid-Atlantic Weed Management uh, Manual, where we have the premixes and we break it out not only by products, but what's the, the amount of product in, in, the, in the containers. Right product, right rate, and this, in my opinion, is the most critical, at the right timing. Spraying Palmer am Amaranth at the right time. Applying the pre-emergence herbicides at planting. Um, these pre-emergence herbicides that will only give us about three to five weeks of residual control. After which they start breaking down, Palmer amaranth grows fast and it could go from half an inch to three inches in a matter of a few, few days. So making those applications at planting so you're providing that residual control while the crop is in, in the field makes a big difference. Spraying when the weeds are small and susceptible and actively growing. Every pesticide label says that. What does that mean? Three inches or less. Three inches or less. Palmer amaranth needs to be controlled when it's three inches or less. That's not three inches. <laughs> That's three inches. And you're not going to see it across your field driving past. You've got to get out and look. Um, you get much beyond three to four inches uh, on Palmer Amaranth, um, you don't have a lot of good options. And we know it grows fast. So if it's three inches today, it's not going to be three inches tomorrow. So get out and scout and, and spray it while it's small. Um, don't wait till all, you know, with, with, with the old Roundup approach, wait till everything's up and spray it and it'll kill everything. We can't do that with Palmer Amaranth. We got to spray it when it's small. And we're not talking the average field. We're talking those, those, the first, those tallest plants start reaching three, four inches tall. That's when we got to get out to spray. Because if we miss those, we let them get too big and spray. Those are the ones that are going to produce more seeds than later emerging Palmer Amaranth. So, 
If you're not going to, if you're, if, if, if you can't get out and scout, 28 days is the magic number between pre-emergence applications and your post-emergence applications. 28 days. We, when, when we set up our trials, we, we just religiously go 28 days from when the pre's were applied to when we spray our post. And year in and year out, we have the most consistent success with that approach. So if you're not going to scout, 28 days. There are no rescue treatments for Palmer Amaranth. They're, uh, they're, they're just, they're, we've looked at all the different products post-emergence with all the additives and all the goodies in there and you might get a little bit more leaf burn but you're not going to kill tall Palmer Amaranth. So small, three inches or 28 days after, not after planting, but 28 days after that previous herbicide application. And this is very important, particularly in soybeans. This is uh, um, something that Ben Beal did a, a few years ago. Um, and uh, uh, boy, I give him credit for, for, for doing this project. Had a number of different pre-emergence herbicides and then went out um, at, um, at like weekly intervals and measured the height of the Palmer amaranth that was uh, um, for the Palmer amaranth that was in the field. And so just the point here is at 17 days, there was very little um, height out there on that Palmer amaranth. By 24 days, you can see that uh, some of the poor performing herbicides are well over uh, um, um, uh, uh, three inches tall. <laughs> Some of the better performing herbicides at 24 days are under three inches tall. But by 31 days after treatment, even the best of the treatments um, are over three inches tall. So that uh, 28, win 28 day window is really what, uh, what we're targeting. Dicamba, you know, it's, while, you know, it's, it's we, we think of it as a new product now for soybeans, I mean, dicamba's been on the market for how long? Um, you know, it came out in the 60s maybe. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's not gonna control tall Palmer amaranth. This is six, six inches tall. It put a nice crook in that stem, but it didn't kill it. <coughs> so controlling Palmer amaranth, we have options. We need to be careful not to develop additional resistance. We need to use strategies that produce shade to slow down its growth like a good crop canopy or cover crops. And if we have the problem, making sure that we don't spread the problem, keeping it contained in the field. Um, it means cleaning combines, maybe strategically uh, timing or uh, 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 sequence on which fields we're harvesting. So we keep that problem contained and don't spread it. So I talked a lot about Palmer amaranth and I don't want to give the impression obviously that's the only problem that we have uh, for resistance. This is uh, um, over here, well it's not, it's not this county, it's a little bit further south, but some Palmer, uh, some common ragweed. I got called out on this a couple years ago. Farmer sprayed, sprayed Roundup, it didn't die, sprayed Roundup um, again with, with first rate, didn't die, and then sprayed it with Cobra and still didn't die. So we took it to the greenhouse and planted it out. Um, this is, uh, these three up across the top were sprayed with Reflex. This uh, middle was sprayed with, with uh, uh, glyphosate and the bottom was sprayed with first rate. And we sprayed at a 1x rate, a 2x rate, and a 4x rate. So this population is surviving um, all, uh, all three of those, those classes of chemistry. Uh, I, uh, I thought I had the slide. We took these surviving plants and sprayed them with glyphosate, reflex, and first rate all in the same tank um, and we didn't kill them. So three-way resistance um, is in this area. So, uh, you know, for, for corn, fortunately, this is still very sensitive to atrazine. Atrazine is a good option for controlling it. Post-emergence, um, atrazine or atrazine with, with, with one of those HPPD herbicides. Um, um, dicamba, again, one of those safe and dicambas. Gives us some, some options that we can uh, control it in, in corn. 
Soybeans, uh, we're not quite as fortunate. These pre-emergence herbicides, Ametribuzin, Lorox, Linux, Command, um, while they're, they give us some control, they're not great on, um, on, on uh, common ragweed. We really need to look at post-emergence um, in soybeans and plan on it. And the Liberty Link soybeans, the uh, Dicamba or the 2,4-D are really our three options for controlling this post-emergence. Any, uh, any questions or comments about ragweed? Yes? Do you have, have you seen any um, resistance to atrazine and semazine? I, I put atrazine and semazine on my corn pre plant or actually, yeah, I, think it's pre <laughs> I don't know exactly what it is, but I put it on there when the corn was, put, and I also put some on. Anyway, no. Atrazine, semazine, we, and I had right there. No. So, so have, have, have we seen any triazine resistance uh, um, ragweed in this area and being resistant to either simazine or atrazine? And no, we haven't. Um, we've tested the samples that we've had in the greenhouse with atrazine, and they all seem to be dying. So uh, we, 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 we haven't seen that um, in this area. Okay. We, we, we can talk later. <laughs> uh, Palmer amaranth. Um, uh, this is what I was talking about. We have no good options for large Palmer amaranth. This Palmer amaranth was 14 inches tall when we sprayed it with dicamba. Um, small plants died. The large ones continued to grow and produce tremendous amount of seed back into the seed bank. Um, we went back and sprayed these a second time, about four, or excuse me, about seven days apart. And you can see we, uh, uh, we stunted them even more, but there's still Palmer amaranth in that plot. So two applications um, wasn't enough. Now, I will note that this was 30 inch row soybeans, so it didn't canopy quite as quickly, and that probably contributed to, uh, um, you know, we, I know we would have gotten better control with the, the two applications of dicamba uh, had we had narrower rows because of the shading um, we get. And the reason I, because um, we, we, we followed up on that trial looking at uh, uh, a number of different technologies for uh, Palmer Amaranth control, the Flexstar GT, Liberty, Enlist Dual, and Ingenia all sprayed on Palmer Amaranth that was about 14 inches tall. Nothing gave us um, um, excellent control. The Enlist Duo, a little bit better, 82, but not commercially acceptable when you have Palmer Amaranth. Oh, you, what we did is we went back and sprayed these plots a second time, uh, seven days later, uh, with another application of Liberty, another application of Enlist Duo, another application of Ingenia, and we were basically 97 to 100 percent control um, with two applications in narrow road soybeans. So if it gets large on you, um, we just don't have good tools that are going to control it uh, on larger Palmer Amaranth. And, and um, it's really, I think, going to take two applications to kill those larger Palmer Amaranth plants, as opposed to trying to load three or four different active ingredients in the tank or, or a lot of different adjuvants that doesn't seem to help much on Palmer Amaranth. So control it while it's small. And I'll just finish up here with some comments about the dicamba soybeans, um, you know, some of our experiences. And granted, remember, I'm coming from Sussex County, Delaware. Watermelon, lima beans, snap beans, you know, we have a lot of vegetables in the area. So we, we're, we're, we're um, concerned about potential for off-target movement. I think this technology with time, we're going to learn more on where its best fit is and how to uh, uh, manage uh, uh, off-target movement. But we're not there yet. I mean, if, if, if it's still moving in large parts of Illinois and, and, and Arkansas and Missouri, we need, we need more work to, to understand um, what's going on there. So be careful if, if you think that you're thinking about using it. Um, I find that applications after May, so we're talking uh, um, after uh, Memorial Day, increase the risk of off-target movement, primarily because of the higher temperatures. Um, but, uh, and, and 
And so using it in crop increases the risk. If you're going to use it, follow all the guidelines. Spray it on small weeds. Um, this is just kind of illustrating. This is uh, um, looking at uh, um, the, the temperatures from uh, uh, burn down in corn, um, uh, post-emergence in corn versus soybeans burned down in, in crop. And this is the, the average high temperature for that week. So corn in crop um, and, and burn down, you know, less than 80 degrees. Our burn down in soybeans, we're about 74 degrees. But we start getting into our post-emergence applications in soybeans, and we're above that 85 degrees, we're increasing our risk of off-target movement. Read the label if you want to use this. Read the label. Um, I did a little search with, uh, with, with, with the labels and looked at how many times does the phrase do not show up on the label. Okay, reflex and liberty, um, on, a, on a per page basis, we have uh, uh, one and a half times uh, for, for liberty, or excuse me, for, for reflex, liberty a little bit higher. But you get up to this ingenia and extend 4.2 times per page, and it's about a 40 page label. So there's a lot of don'ts on that label. You got to make sure you read it and you understand it. You also need, if you're going to apply it, you need to t do the training um, uh, to be certified. That's required by the label. So read the label, key points, and, and particularly for Palmer Amaranth, but, but overall weed control, using the right products, using it at the right rate, and really critical, using it at the right time. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so thanks, Mark. Good job. So while Nicole gets ready, we'll hear from a couple of our sponsors. Um, Greg, you want to come up? Greg Holland is here, and then we'll hear from Dale. Kevin, you want to say a few words too? And I'll get your, I'll get your PowerPoint up. I just, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for their business last year. Look forward to moving ahead, and I guess, you know, Mark talked about, uh, you know. The different herbicides but one thing we we need to keep in mind is everybody's planting even more different kinds of beans so now we're going to have gt27 beans so that's liberty link uh you know roundup ready hppds you still got guys growing conventional beans roundup ready one beans straight liberty link beans dicamba beans and now i've got guys saying i'm i'm getting rid of my beans i'm going to grow enlist beans so there's a lot of potential of mistakes. So just, you know, and I've, I've got people that they think 2,4-D beans are the same as dicamba beans. So you just, there's a lot of potential problems. It's not just the herbicides, it's what we're growing to, and we need, we need to really keep that in mind. So it never hurts. <laughs> Some people, they always tell me, well, I didn't want to ask you a question because I didn't want to feel stupid. There is no such thing as a stupid question. So just, you know, just, double check, make sure everything's going out first and just try to do it right, common sense. So, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Greg. All right. Um, see, Dale Hawks is from, here from USDA from the National Ag Statistics. I'm sure he probably needs your help in something. Right, Dale? <laughs> what an introduction. <laughs> Always need your help. Uh, yes, we are doing our March uh, prospective planning survey. You might have seen it in the mail. It uh, just went out this week. Uh, that will be for our March uh, 29th release. We'll release about what everybody thinks they're going to be planting uh, this spring as far as corn, soybeans, or uh, anything like that. Uh, we always need your reports. Uh, it's very important for the uh, Farm Bill or for other people that do research and different things with the university that they have valid information, that they know what's going on out in the county or out in the state or in the country. So please, when you see those surveys, please fill them out on a timely basis or we'll call you or we'll come by and see you. Um, I have enumerators in the field that are out here. I do have a booth out here with more information, but please uh, try to be diligent with those surveys and fill them out. I know it's sometimes a bother, sometimes they're long, but a lot of the surveys during the year are not that long, like the census every five years that we are going to release April 11th uh, for the 2017 census. Uh, it was delayed a little bit with the shutdown earlier uh, this year, 
So we have delayed it. It was going to be released the 21st of February, but uh, we delayed it to 11th of uh, April. So if you have any questions, I'll be around all, all day. So uh, please stop by. Again, my name is Dale Hawks. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. For those of you that don't know, we have to, as a county ag agent, we have to fill out a survey every week that, that goes into them. And it is, uh, that's, it's not too bad, but um, it, it is important that we do that because I come, if we get it on Friday, it says it's got to be done by Monday at 10 o'clock. And so it's already started and, you know, it'll, they'll talk, you know, we have to kind of rate what crops are, what we think has been planted. The first, our first one was just last week. So um, it was just general comment. My general comment is wheat looks like crap. Um, but uh, it's just uh, and not much else going on. No manure has been spread, but just that I, you know, I didn't think that farmers, you know, some wheat, you know, may be killed just because of the way that that wheat looks. So anyway, so Kevin, you want to come on up? So thanks for being a sponsor. We appreciate it. Thank you. Sound like you did a lot of scouting last week with that uh, wheat survey there. So uh, my name is Kevin Dean with Valent USA. I'd like to. Thank you for your uh, support and uh, business in the past with Valent Products. Have a full portfolio as far as uh, insecticide, fungicide, herbicide, PGRs for vegetables, fruit, and also for a row crop. Um, I've got a booth in there to, uh, with some information. Uh, Mark just talked a lot about resistance. Uh, we have a number of uh, great products. He, you saw some of the names of my products up there with the uh, Valor. Uh, for use, and a lot of you fighting the uh, mare's tail, or maybe have some issues with uh, uh, some of the common ragweed or the uh, palmer. And so, between the, the valor and, and the fierce chemistry that we have, you're getting uh, multiple modes of action. We have a new one we've introduced called Fierce MTZ, which gives you the metribuzin piece. So, if you're one of the people that have issues with uh, common ragweed, that could be a nice fit for you, give you some great. Uh, residual program to start your season off before you, you know, look at what you need to do post-emergent. So uh, just encourage you to uh, think about that. I think the Valor makes for a good uh, building block in uh, whether it's corn or soybeans when you're putting your program together. And just one thing I wanted to point out, uh, our company, Valent USA, have a number of good, uh, really good insecticides. Uh, some of you may have used them in different crops, uh, Belay and Danitol and Venom. And we're concerned with bees and pollinators in all, uh, all crops. So we have some information as far as some guides for those of you that are looking for ways to help, help the cause and uh, keep our environment strong uh, for the future. So just uh, invite you to stop by and, and pick something up on that. So thank you very much. Have a great day today.